Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm gonna share with you this case of a patient who has a dislocated three-piece lens and a CTR. I actually did his cataract surgery several years ago, and at the time of his surgery, I sensed he had some weak zonules, so I put in a three-piece lens as well as placed a capsule retention ring. And this case just simply shows, despite those precautionary maneuvers, it didn't really matter. This patient still had a dislocated lens. And now I have the challenge of taking out not only the lens, but also the capsular retention ring. And you'll be able to see my modified intraskeletal haptic fixation technique using the Johnson & Johnson Sensar IOL. So you can see the capsular bag, the CTR, as well as the three-piece lens here. So beautiful here. I'm marking the limbus with the ink pen and then using the cannula to find 180 degrees apart I also have that cannula pre-marked at the tip, and I'm able to mark 180 degrees apart. This caliper is set at 2.5 millimeters, and I make a mark 2.5 millimeters posterior to the limbus in radial fashion, and then using the cannula that's pre-marked to mark 2 millimeters adjacent. I do the same thing on the left side, again, indenting the sclera 2.5 millimeters posterior to that first mark with the caliper. And then using the marked cannula tip, I'm marking that spot as well as two millimeters adjacent. I'm also marking contraincisionally. And this is the indentation four millimeters posterior to the limbus for the trocar. I'm gonna tunnel with the trocar needle and then you turn 90 degrees and enter. And you know that's a good entry because the trocar is sitting sideways a little bit. I'm making my paracentesis incisions for lens removal, as well as for the AC maintainer, as well as the contralateral incision to externalize the leading haptic. This is intracameral lidocaine and then some intracameral epinephrine. You can see the lens is wobbling a little bit. And then some dispersive viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium. And this is the three millimeter keratone blade. I make a vertical groove and then enter. So I'm using two forceps here to grasp the CTR and the lens. And you can imagine it's a much bigger diameter than the pupil. So I'm gonna to have to use some maneuvers to get that complex up anteriorly. So I switch hands and I have a Maltzman in my right hand and I'm trying to retract the pupil and get the CTR and the haptic up anterior to the iris plane. Once I have that, I switch and I grab with my right hand and then the Maltzman and my left hand switching and trying to get that complex up. But as I do this, the CTR pops out of the wound. And so that's actually a blessing in disguise. I'm able to just carefully hold the CTR up. But you can see the bag is up as well as the trailing haptic came out of the wound. So that was actually fortuitous for me. It, it took me a little bit by surprise, so I was kind of like trying to figure out what to do. But now I have my serrated forceps grabbing it with the left hand, cutting the lens in half with the scissors in my right, switching my right hand for forceps. I'm trying to grab it, but this, is, this must be a silicone lens. It's a little slippery. So I'm switching hands to the serrated forceps in my right hand now. It's kind of drifting off. So I'm grabbing the haptic with the left and then grab the lens with my right hand there. So that piece came out pretty easily, I'm going after the right side now. But as, you, as I do this, the lens is kind of, the optic is kind of slipping away. So I grab the haptic with my right hand, rotate the lens piece a little bit, and then I was able to take it out pretty easily there. So this is a 20 gauge Lewicki AC maintainer. And then I'm gonna start vitrectomy. And so pay attention here. This is kind of troubleshoot. This is very important when you're troubleshooting and you're doing these cases. As I'm doing vitrectomy, notice something. First of all, 
you're seeing a bolus of fluid or or vitreous something uh, through the main, main wound. And that's because the vacuum was not high enough. And so I had to tell the technician, you know, something's not right. And I don't believe the, the handpiece was primed properly. And so we went back and did it again. And so of course now I have good vacuum and aspiration and I'm able to do the vitrectomy adequately. And so you can see I did that in 4X speed, just for time's sake. I inflated the eye with some more viscoelastic. And since the pupil's small, I made some more stab incisions. And then whenever the pupil's small, I don't hesitate to place iris hooks. Because when you're trying to cannulate the haptic through the needle, you shouldn't be struggling with your visibility. And hooks are pretty easy to do. They're annoying, but they're very, very helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and put these iris hooks in. Again, it's a little annoying, but nonetheless, it's not that difficult. You just place it through, make sure it's pointing down, hook it, and then pull the sleeve down, the this, this stopper, uh, and it holds and secures the iris hook in place. You hook it and then push the stopper down. Again, not difficult to do, but it is one extra step. But again, in the cases like this, you don't really have a lot of margin for error. You want to execute the surgery as perfectly as you can. So this is the right side needle. I'm bending it about nine millimeters from the, the tip. This is the left side needle. And this is the 25 gauge needle that's going to be used to externalize the leading haptic. The bevel is facing to the right. So that's the lens. This is the sensor lens. I have the cartridge there. Use some forceps to hold the haptic gently. The cartridge um, has already been filled with viscoelastic and some BSS. And you want to make sure that it's seated down into the cartridge. And you can tell if it is or is not. And of course, the haptics need to be seated down as well. Because as you fold that down, you should see that the leading haptics coming out straight and entering into the barrel and the trailing haptic should be sticking out at the end. You want to make sure that the haptics are not kinked as you bring and fold the cartridge closed. So that's all I'm doing there, just being a little compulsive. Go ahead and place the 25 gauge needle through the contralateral incision and then placing the cartridge through the main incision here. So here, um, my assistant's supposed to help me, and I, I want her to always have BSS on hand, because why? You need BSS in order to visualize what you're doing, and because you have some corneal folds and stria as you're doing the maneuver. And since she's going to be pushing the plunger forward, and she doesn't have access to the table, I asked her to go grab the BSS cannula. So she went ahead and put BSS on the cornea, and then look how nice the view is. I'm able to proceed. She helped advance the lens. And then once I was able to externalize the leading haptic, I took over and then I'm sweeping the trailing haptic to the right. Inject some viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium. And once the lens is fully unfolded, I'm holding the trocar with my left hand, tunneling with the needle two millimeters and then going straight down, staying in the same plane. And then once I've entered, I rotate. You don't want to rotate too prematurely, otherwise you can hit the ciliary body. Very carefully, I'm gently sliding the trailing haptic in. And again, these are PMMA haptics, you wanna be very careful, but you can flatten it on the bevel of the needle, dock it, and then it just goes in very nicely. It's really not that difficult at all. You can see very well controlled, no tension, no stress on the haptic when you do this. And then since I have this mounted on a syringe, I'm disengaging the needle from the syringe with the hemostat. Internalize the leading haptic with microforceps here as well. And again, you can see because I use the iris retractors, how easy the visibility is. Holding the incision with my right hand, tunneling with my left hand with the needle through the sclera, two millimeters, dive down in the same plane. And then once I pierce through, I rotate only after I pierce through. Grabbing the haptic, flattening it out on the bevel, making sure it's nice and parallel and straight and then I'm able to advance it pretty nicely here. So again, with the sensor lens, it's pretty tacky. It's got good holdability in the lumen of the 
of the needle. So as I pull the needle towards me on the left and away from me on the right side, I try to use equal forces, looking at the optic, make sure it's centered as I do this. Now you can see the haptic on the left side. It came out and it's not retracting. And that's the difference between this and the CT Lucia lens. The haptics on the CT Lucia do try to tend to slip back, slip back in. So I'm holding it and look what happens here. I'm gonna cauterize, but instead of, uh, well, I did get the haptic tip, but I also got the iris retractor. So that was a little bit of a shocking thing. So I heated and melted both. And so th that's one little downside of using iris retractors in this situation, as I can melt the iris retractor while I'm trying to melt the tip of the haptic. But that's okay, I go ahead and uh, pull that off. You can see it just melted off, pull the stopper off, and then very carefully just take that iris hook out. Of course, I'm not gonna be able to use that iris hook anymore. So go ahead and uh, pull the stopper back on each of these and then take the iris hooks out one by one. You can see on the right side, there's a lot of heme there, so you can't really see the haptic as clearly here on the screen, but I'm confident that there's a small bulb at the tip of the haptic on the right side. So the hooks are out. I'm gonna push the haptics flush to the sclera, reapproximating the conjunctiva, and doing the same thing on the right side as well. Again, you can see there's a heme there, so I'm using a cotton tip to kind of help my visibility, and then I push it flush. This is a 10 nylon suture. I always close the main incision when I'm doing these cases, just in case there's vitreous that wants to come forward. I like to have a nice closed system in these cases. So this is peripheral iridectomy time. I switch the setting. You can see it has a lower cut rate, high vacuum, and um, you wanna be able to get maximum suction so you can cut very slowly and create a small little iridectomy. So I switched to antivitrectomy. You see the pupil's a little peaked. So there was a little vitreous there. I got that vitreous there on the left side. And then I just continue some more vitrectomy. Since this patient didn't have a, a complete vitrectomy, it's really important to make sure you have a thorough anterior vitrectomy here. So I'm inspecting, making sure there's no vitreous. Go ahead and inject some intracameral triamcinolone as well, some Kenalog. And then I can see there's a little bit of vitreous right there at the wound. Spend a lot more time here doing vitrectomy after this, wanting to make sure there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And then going posteriorly as well, I'm getting around that pupillary edge because that's where the vitreous is gonna wrap around, try to go around the vitreous. I pull the trocar out and massage the sclerotomy Pull the AC maintainer out as well. And as I hydrate my incisions, I was doing the Seidel test and I noticed that the AC maintainer incision was leaky, so I had to place the suture there. So you, you don't want to ever hesitate to put sutures in because a leaky wound means it might cause vitreous to come out out of that wound. It's just not worth that risk. So now I have a really nice watertight incisions, a nice round pupil, no evidence for vitreous in anterior chamber with a perfectly centered sensor lens with skull fixation. At the end, I inject some lidocaine and then Kenalog as well as some antibiotics. So I hope this was helpful to you and I thank you for your attention.